Welcome to the Embarcadero C++ Builder Bootcamp. This is day one, building your first application with C++ Builder. I'm David I. Uh, you can reach me at david.intersimony at embarcadero.com. Let's start with David Millington, the C++ Builder product manager, introducing day one of the C++ Builder Bootcamp. Hi, and welcome to the first day of our week-long C++ Bootcamp. We have a great series of sessions planned, covering topics from just getting started through to modern C++, making games, creating great user interfaces, and moving our apps to native mobile applications, as well as a conversation between Patrick Scheller of the C++ Google Plus Group and Bruno Babay, one of our compiler engineers. So, lots of interesting material. I hope you've redeemed your free license of C++ Builder Starter in order to download and use the code samples too, but if you haven't yet, don't worry, We'll make it available all week for the duration of the bootcamp. Today is an introduction to making your first C++ application. C++ Builder, our IDE, can be different to other C++ IDEs. We support many platforms, right now Windows, Mac, iOS and Android, with Linux coming soon, and use enhanced claim-based compilers. We also have great tools and frameworks, not just for database and web, but for things like building apps that are connected together or for cross-platform but native UEs. But we'll get to that later. Here's David I, one of our tech experts, to give you an introduction to building your first C++ application. On the links I have uh, on my blog post, you'll see these different links to these pages. This is the, the C++ Builder Product Editions page. So we're using C++ Starter during this bootcamp week, but you can also use the Pro Edition, the Enterprise Edition, the Architect Edition of C++ Builder. Uh, the difference in Starter Edition, which has that free for now special offer, uh, is that it, it has all the capabilities of the language compiler, as well as you can build Win32 applications with the Starter Edition using both the Visual Component Library, VCL, or the FireMonkey framework, FMX. This is that note about the special offer that's happening right now that David M. referred to. Uh, the Starter Edition, if you go to the shop site uh, or just search for C++ Builder Starter Edition Special Offer uh, with your Google Chrome, for example, and you'll see that it currently is uh, $0, and you can download the install, and it will give you the, uh, it will send, we'll send you a key that you can use as part of the install. This is the Starter Edition landing page, which talks about the key features, the full ID, and so on. Uh, then, uh, again, more about the, the, the free tool we have under, uh, under the Embarcadero uh, web page on www.embarcadero.com. We also have a free command line compiler, the C++ compiler. It's the same Clang enhanced compiler if you just want to do um, some RTL work, some boost work, some, some uh, console application based or other kind of development using the C++11 language, we have the free command line compiler that's been updated to be the same compiler that's in Starter Pro Enterprise and Architect Edition. And then I have the link to cppreference.com uh, where we keep updated our uh, compiler support for the C++ Sullivan language. So you'll see on the column here, uh, Embarcado C++ Builder and by all of the approved standards and some of the draft uh, papers that are going on, you'll see where we have uh, support along the way. The other thing to look uh, on this uh, column, if it hasn't been updated, is if you look at the Clang column, uh, we're shipping version 3.3 of our Clang enhanced C++ builder compiler. So if uh, if you see yes down a the line then and you look down the Clang uh, column, you'll see the 2.93031. Since we're using 3.3, uh, then anything that's 3.3, you'll see down here like inheriting constructors 3.3, uh, then we have yes in our column uh, as well. And at the bottom of this report, you know, CPP reference, uh, we reference the each of the vendors who update this page uh, reference the version of, uh, of the compiler. So there it is, 10.1 Berlin uh, across all the... Uh, Clang enhanced compilers and platforms that are in our you know, are in our product. So uh, you can use this as a nice reference to see how Embarcado C++ Builder stacks up to other uh, other vendors, provider, compiler. And we're constantly working on updating 
uh, our compilers as Clang moves along as well. And in the ID here, I'll just say File New, and you can have your choices um, of starting, for example, a VCL or a multi-device app. When you see multi-device app, it means FireMonkey or FMX-based framework. You can also go under File Other Projects, and then you can build a console application, a control panel app, a DLL, since it's Windows, um, this is the multi-device target, and then the VCL forms build a static library and some other Windows-based things. Okay, so let's do this. Let's just build a starting multi-device application. And we have two choices in the project templates here. One is a blank application and a, and a starting 3D application. Let's just build a blank FireMonkey application. And now we're in... Uh, the IDE, and you'll see a few things. The structure window in the upper left, that just shows uh, the objects that are instantiated in the visual design environment uh, for C++ Builder Starter. Down here is the object inspector where we can change different properties like the client width and so on. You can also uh, change uh, in the design surface and notice the client height and width changed uh, if you haven't seen this before. Down here, we've, up here we've got our project window. And down here is the tool palette of the components and so on with hundreds and hundreds of components. So for example, if we want a, a button, we can just start typing button and say what I want is I want uh, a T button. That's probably the simplest application. And then on the user interface, we have uh, go down to the object inspector and the text property that's like click me, right? And then I put this somewhere double click on it to bring up the event handler or you can go to the events tab and also uh, hook any of the events that you want entering exiting the the button uh, on mouse enter and leave in the button area and so on and then it starts building the event handler uh, method so we can go in and for example just say button one uh, we're going to set its text property and we'll set that equal to hello and that's uh, probably the simplest uh, programming that we might do and then hit run and if I didn't uh, do something wrong it should uh, compile and link the application and then when I click on it uh, it changes to hello world All right so there's our first simplest application that we would build as using the FireMonkey framework. We can do the same thing for VCL, which is a wrapper over the Windows API only. But with FireMonkey, you get started in Starter Edition uh, today. And then if you upgrade to Pro Enterprise Architect, you can then just change target platform under here. If there were other choices, Starter Edition only comes with Win32. You could recompile this same application as is for Win64, Mac OS X, iOS, and Android with no changes. And FireMonkey handles all of that under the covers. And you'll get more about that in the coming, uh, in the coming days in the boot camp as well. Uh, we've got full support for debugging and, uh, and all of that. So you can just set a, you know, you can set a breakpoint here and then say run with debugging versus run without debugging. Right, and then when we click this, we're back in the ID. It shows us the stack trace, and we can evaluate and hover over variables and so on. Bring up a CPU viewer. There's lots of debugging. Of, there's lots of debug windows that we can that we can play with. For example, looking at the entire CPU window. So here's the uh, the optimized code that came out of the compiler. Uh, and where we're at the breakpoint, we could step and change values of registers and all of that kind of stuff. Now, one other thing to note while we're here is under the project options choice is there's lots of different compiler and linker options. One that you'll want to pay attention to in the current release of C++ Builder, uh, this use classic compiler, that's our old C++ 0x compiler. Uh, that's turned on by default. So if you want to use the C++11 language uh, beyond the, I think we had nine. Oh, that's weird. Something just, that was weird. Huh. Okay. Uh, something, uh, if you want to use something beyond C++0x, we had nine of the early C++11 uh, choices. Uh, you'll want to turn, you'll want to turn that option off 
to not use the classic compiler. And then once you've done that in your project and as you're working on things, then uh, you can use the full C++11 language uh, in the Clang Enhanced Compiler that we ship in C++ Builder 10.1 Berlin Starter, Pro, uh, Enterprise, and Architect. If you want to build, uh, if you want to build complete standalone executables, then you want to turn off Link with Dynamic RTL, and also down in uh, in Packages, you'll want to turn off Link with Runtime Packages. Then it'll build an executable that has all the RTL linked into it. Uh, otherwise, for C++, we generate very small executables that rely on runtime DLLs for the memory manager and the C++ standard runtime library and so on uh, being on the path on your Windows machine. So turning those two options off, if you always want to be able to give someone an executable that doesn't rely on any other DLLs installed other than the Windows API, for example, then uh, turning those two options off is, is a good thing as well. And then we'll just uh, run uh, the rest of this and then it, the event handler fires again. Okay. All right. Uh, next, what I want to do is show you a few uh, other C++ examples. One of the things that, uh, that I've been doing is following along Bjarne Stustrup's uh, tour of C++, and he's got... Uh, some samples that he's put uh, in his uh, in his book, and so I've created C++ Builder equivalents for a few of those samples. So this one is just using the the streaming, the standard uh, C out C in uh, to output a string uh, in in a main program. This is a console application, then getting uh, uh, input, waiting for a character to come back in. In this case, I've got uh, project options set and so here I've got the compiler don't use the classic compiler and that's fine so I wanted to use the Clang Enhanced compiler so I've turned that off and then if we just run this example it, it does what you'd expect it puts a console it waits for a, a you know a key to be input and then uh, it comes back to the source code another example that he has in his book that I also uh, did is I, it, this one just squares any value that uh, that you pass to it and then outputs that using the the streaming uh, C out call again uh, to output the strings and so you know here we are there's uh, the square of those numbers uh, and so on All right so just a starting point to let us uh, take a look at the language here uh, and you're going to get a lot more of this in day three on the C++ 11 language so using the new auto uh, that is part of C++11 to have it automatically type uh, different variables for you so you don't have to say, you know, bool this, int this, and so on. I just say auto b equals true, and then it knows, hey, that's a bool type, and uh, ch equals, a, you know, a single character, that's a care type, and, you know, auto something with an integer, then it does the right thing, right? So. Those are just parts of support, again, inside of uh, the Clang Enhanced compiler. Again, in these samples, I have the, the compiler set to use classic compiler false, so it uses C++11. If I turn this on and I try to compile it, uh, I'll get errors where it says, you know, uh, declaration error syntax and so on. So that's what you'll, you'll find if you don't turn off that compiler. Um, and uh, the classic compiler, then again, everything works fine, except uh, that something's running under the covers. But but otherwise, it didn't file fly off all of those dis different uh, error messages. Okay, let's uh, not save any of that. Okay, all right. So another example I I'll bring up. It's a it, this is a example of a, of a project and then we can have a project group as well and the way you create project groups is to you just add uh, additional existing or new projects to the project group so let's go here and go here and go here and let's see that's parallel primes so that's parallel four let's bring up the t task one so now i've got a couple of projects and once you have a project group, you can do things like clean all, build all, compile all. And again, you can uh, add a new or existing project to create larger project groups as well. So 
Uh, this, this first example, um, it's going to use uh, what's included in 10.1 Berlin. It's our parallel programming library uh, for C++. So I've got two buttons here and uh, a serial version and a parallel version of a for loop or standard for loop and a parallel for loop. Uh, and I'm going to calculate the number of primes that are found in uh, in a range of 0 to 50,000. And so the the parallel button version, it starts a stopwatch and it just calls is prime, passing it uh, the numbers between 1 and, uh, and the max. Um, and is prime up here just does a brute force test to look to see if that number is a prime number. And then the second, uh, the second example uh, button here is uses the parallel programming library, T parallel colon colon is the name space four, and we pass it the, uh, the starting one to the maximum. And then inside here, we, we use a lambda, so we, we capture the reference, and then we pass uh, this index in. And then we call the same is prime, passing the index, just as we did if I scroll back up um, in, the, uh, in the standard for loop. So this parallel for loop is a, is a class that's part of the parallel programming library, and it supports passing a C++11 lambda function uh, inside of the body. And then it counts up the... Uh, the number of primes. So let's go and run this example. Uh, I'm running on a machine that's got four cores. Uh, there's the serial parallel, uh, serial for loop. Uh, it found uh, 5,134 primes. Um, and again, the time run is 428 milliseconds. And then uh, the parallel version runs in 135 milliseconds, finds the same number of primes. So that's just using um, a C++11 Lambda function uh, inside of uh, inside the event handler to show that you can do parallel programming uh, using the, the runtime library that's in C++ Builder Starter and above uh, the parallel programming library. Uh, we also have support for task, running tasks. So here's a button that just creates an array of tasks, in this case two tasks. It creates them, uh, has them do something, in this case puts them to sleep, uh, and then when they come out of doing some long running algorithm, for example, or a SQL query or whatever, then we, uh, we will increment saying that that task is, has complete by updating a, a global counter, which is defined inside the form class. And then we have two different methods that we can call on T task. One is wait for any task to complete. The other one is finally to wait for all tasks complete. So depending on how you want to do your parallel algorithms inside of your C++11 applications, you can, uh, you can use the, the parallel task part of the, of the parallel programming library and, uh, and start up multiple tasks that are off doing things while your user interface is responsive or, or your application is doing something else. Right. Okay, and so let's just run this example. And uh, what is, oh, that's right. Let me do a clean build. It was just letting me know that the precompiled header was out of date. So uh, precompiled headers, we use these to, uh, to speed up the, the, uh, the compilation process so that we don't have to recompile all the header files again. Uh, so here we're starting all the tasks, all tasks started. Uh, that first one that waited for three seconds, at least one task is done, and then all tasks are done. All right. So that's a second sample uh, parallel library that uses a, a lambda inside of the task create uh, to, in this case, I'm not passing anything in, I'm, but I'm accessing this, uh, this counter, which is declared right here. Um, and it gives me access to it. So you can use lambdas uh, inside of the uh, parallel programming library uh, in C++. Let me add one other existing project. This one is a future. And what a future is, is a, uh, is a way to define a type. So here we say ttask future. We pass it the type of the value that we're going to wait for. 
uh, to have some value. So by declaring this a future and then we sleep or do some processing for a while. Um, and then after we start that future up, well, we'll sleep for a little bit. And then here I want to get the value of that future. And so at this point, at this statement on line 28, what will happen is that the application will wait under the covers until that, uh, until that future has a value. Right, so here it's going to sleep during doing some calculation and, and inside of the task when it gets created. And then the main program is going to sleep for one second. So it's going to have to wait. It's going to get blocked right here when we try to access the value of the future. Uh, in this case, it's going to be the return value of, of 42. And then we'll output that value. So let's go and uh, let's do a clean again. And a build, well, let's just do a run that will do a build for us. Okay, again, because it did a clean, it had to compile those header files. So now it just sits there and waits until finally uh, the future gets a value, and it says the future has a value of 42, and the application can continue. So here again, using a lambda uh, inside to just uh, show that we can use the C++11 language throughout uh, our applications. And again, more about C++11 in, in, uh, on Wednesday. All right. And then just a couple of other examples. Let me bring up uh, one of our uh, C VCL Win10 uh, type applications. This is the activity indicator uh, component. Uh, you'll see that in uh, in Windows 10, it's it's that kind of curving, um, uh, yeah, animated kind of display when you have an indeterminate amount of time when something is going to complete, right? You could use progress bars or other things to say if you know something's going to take 10 seconds, you can you can dictate how, what its progress is along the way in whatever mechanism you want a heartbeat beating faster or whatever. But in Windows 10, you'll see this kind of indeterminate uh, little swirling dot. And so we have that in, uh, in, our, in our component library called T-Activity Indicator. And let's just uh, run this example. And let's animate it. So now there's that indeterminate. Uh, we can also uh, change the, you know, the delay so it doesn't run as fast and you know, run slower. Uh, you can change the size of the indicator. These are all property settings of the component. We're just using a user interface uh, here. That's sort of a white on white. I don't think that's going to show up very well, so we'll change it back. And then, uh, you know, you can change the type of the indeterminate indicator. This is the momentum dots, which uh, Microsoft comes up with. I wanted to use this as well because you can, it shows how you can change the style just by changing a, a, a style setting. For your VCL, we also have styles in FireMonkey. I think you'll see that tomorrow on day two. There's the Windows Dark style and the default Windows 10 style. And the way you set up styles in a VCL-based application is under the Project Options. Um, let's see, Application Appearance. Down here, you can specify uh, additional styles that you might want to use in your application. You can also choose, once you've selected those styles that we support, uh, you can choose what the default style is. So if you want a Windows 10 style, then uh, you can have that be the default style. In FireMonkey, we have a T style book uh, component uh, that you can drop down. And again, more about that tomorrow. So there's Ruby, Graphite, Onyx, uh, and so on, Obsidian. So you can make your applications look very nice uh, and match the desktop that you have and or a certain look you want for your applications. All right. Uh, one other example I wanted to show, and on all of these samples, not the parallel ones, I'll put those up in some of the command line from the Stuster Tour of C++ book. Uh, this is a, uh, let's go back here. This is ships with uh, with the samples with the starter edition. This is a 3D Fire Monkey uh, um, application. It's got these two uh, rotating planets. One is uh, I think that's Mars on the right and Earth on the left. There's a few things to note that are happening here. If we look in the structure window, there's a, a viewport 
uh, the viewport is what we're seeing in the 3D space. This is actually a 2D form with a 3D viewport inside of it. So if we select uh, that component in the structure window, it shows us where this viewport is. And then we have the uh, couple toolbars uh, here at the top and the bottom. Uh, this, this bottom toolbar has a track bar so that we can change the camera position of how we're viewing the, uh, the contents inside of the viewport. And then inside the viewport itself, we have a camera, and the camera is used as a, the point of reference of how you're viewing the viewport. And we're going to move that camera in and out to move uh, uh, from outside looking in and going past the planets and then uh, on the ins going on the other side and looking back at the planets. And with the camera, you can point at um, where the camera points to, or you can, and that's using the target property. In that case, we have this thing called a dummy, and a T-dummy is just a, a container that allows us to, to quickly manipulate all the 3D objects that are controlled by the dummy, rather than having to look at each of the 3D objects and do some, some, uh, some operation on them. So the, the T-dummy is just a container, and it contains two spheres, uh, two T-spheres, one that we've named T-sphere Earth, and one that we have T-sphere uh, Mars, we're calling it. Each one of those has a, an animation, uh, in this case a float animation, and you'll hear about those tomorrow with animations and effects on day two. Uh, a float animation says uh, that you can change uh, a floating point value from uh, from some value, like here it's a start value zero, to a start stop value minus 360. And the property name that we're going to do animation on is the rotation angle Y of the object that the float animation is connected to, which is the sphere of the Earth. And it's uh, got a delay of zero, a duration of one second for the rotation. And we can tell it to loop. You can also invert it so that it rotates one way and then rotates the other way and so on. There's also triggers and such. Again, more about that tomorrow. Uh, for the sphere, uh, it's got a float animation as well. In this case, it's going from 0 to 360, so it's going to rotate the other way. And I'm just changing the rotation angle of the sphere itself uh, using that float animation. And then the last thing is how we put the the texture, a bitmap texture or a color texture, for example, uh, onto the spheres is that each 3D object in FireMonkey has a material source property, and we drop down to uh, to non-visual controls here that uh, uh, I've named it Texture Material Source Earth and Texture Material Source Mars, and in those it, we just specify a bitmap. So here's a bitmap of the Earth kind of flattened out, and the same thing for Mars. If we go to the material source Mars and bring it up, there's the Mars material bitmap, a uh, bitmap material. So that allows us to put on a 3D surface a material, in this case a bitmap versus like color, we could make them the red planet and the blue planet, for example. And then the, this rotation uh, is a switch that we have an event handler for. And what the switch just does is it enables the float animations for the Earth and the uh, and Mars. So to set it to is the switch rotation checked. And if that's true, then it enables both of the float animations. And then the other uh, user interface element we have was that that track bar, which is down here, which allows us to on change track bar change. All we're doing here is we're going to change the position of the camera's z-axis to be the value of the trackbar, which allows us to move the camera uh, in and out of the screen. So, uh, and the trackbar, if we go back to it, uh, has values from 50 to minus 50. So when we look uh, coming out of the screen or we're going to go into the screen, uh, positive and negative. So think x, y, z in three-dimension space. And so that uh, is how we can manipulate the camera. And then this, this label up here is just going to tell us what value we have for the z-axis currently. So let's go and, uh, and run this example. So here's our, our planets, 
and uh, let's turn on the rotation. So now the planets are rotating, uh, and that's just, again, turning on that float animation. More about animations and effects tomorrow. And then let's, uh, let's change. So as we negative, we're moving the camera uh, towards you away from the screen, for example. Uh, right, and then we're going to go fly past, and notice since the target of the camera is the dummy, then it keeps, uh, there they go off in the distance, right, and then we're going to fly by them and come back, right. So by setting the target of the camera in a 3D space to be the dummy, which contains these two planets uh, inside of it, we just use a very few uh, lines of code. I mean, there's not much in this example, there's this uh, displaying the label of what the value is of the trackbar, and then just setting the camera's uh, Z uh, axis position, and then just turning on uh, two float animations on and off based on the switch. And that gives us this cool 3D animated picture of Mars and uh, Earth, not in proportion to where they are in the solar system, right? Okay. So that's just a little bit about uh, some of the things that you can do in the starter edition uh, for Win32. And again, if you move beyond starter edition to Pro, Enterprise, and Architect, then you can uh, you can do even more with database uh, uh, database operations, both local and remote databases, and so on. This is one last example. This is a, a uh, shows a split view. Uh, a split view says is is a way of splitting the screen into a, a, a kind of toolbar or button bar or icon bar on the left hand side, and then on the right hand side the contents of your form. And then it, we use this T image component with an event handler. Uh, we call it. It's called sometimes the hamburger. You'll see that on uh, on uh, smartphone applications where you just tap on that and then a, a menu appears. And so this image menu click just opens and closes the split view. And the split view is all of the user interface. Um, here's the split view that contains uh, these button menu items and so on. So let's just take a look at this real quick. So here, when we want to close the split view to give us the full screen and then open it up again, I'm just clicking up here. Uh, there's a couple options for the, the button bar on the left-hand side. We can have the compact view. So it doesn't completely go away. Uh, it it just shows the icons themselves, and so that's setting one property, the compact view. Uh, and then, do we want the display overlapped or not, so that uh, right and completely collapse or docked? Do we want the split view on the right hand side or the left hand side? And then there's some other options of how it animates or not. So either have it appear or go away, or you can have it slide in and out. And so this, if FireMonkey has an equivalent uh, functionality, this happens to be uh, the VCL version. So again, we can style it that way, uh, running on Windows only. And you'll see uh, in other examples on the other days how to do more of this with the FireMonkey multi-device framework as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, getting started in the ID. There's lots of different views uh, for bringing up structure, looking at the message window, uh, looking at the debug windows. There's lots of choices. Look at the call stack watches, set your breakpoints, and so on. It's a full C++11 development environment. And again, as you move up from the starter edition, target platforms you can install more by bringing up the manage platforms in the tools uh, menu. Uh, once you add new keys to add other platforms like Win64, OS X, iOS, and Android, they'll just show up as well. Under, under build configurations, we have both debug and release uh, choices. So debug will include all the debug symbols. The, the executable will be larger. It also builds some debug external files that you can use. Uh, for example, dumping out debug information. We have a t-dump utility that'll dump out debug information. If you want to do your final release, then uh, choose the release version. And under the project options menu, uh, all the choices also about uh, do you want to set specific options for the release configuration versus debug configuration or for all configurations for each of the platforms, depending on the addition of C++ build you have. So, 
Um, those are all choices that you can specify under build configurations, right? So you can build a debug version for your own work and you can build a release version. And so uh, you just choose to in here. Let's, uh, you just you know, select that to make it a release version, then do a build and that builds a release version. Under, on your, on your hard drive, uh, there's two subdirectories when you build an application. One will be a, a debug build, one will be, could be a release build if you choose to build with each of those options. And, uh, and those will be under the uh, Win32 folder. So that's where you'll find things that you build uh, under the covers uh, on your file system for each, uh, for each of your source code projects. Uh, when you're doing things with form factors, we have form factor support in FMX. Uh, you can also, uh, and there are designers for that um, when you're building FMX where you can see at design time what your application will look like on, uh, on different devices. Let me go back over to the ID for a moment because that's, I think, a good thing, and I think Jim will show you that uh, as well. Let me close uh, this split view, and let's do a file new multi-device C++ application. Okay, if you'll notice down here, we can have the style of Windows because that's all we have. Uh, oh, and then this is, I'm using the starter edition. In the pro and above, you can have the views, and we have lots of different views that are non-Windows, iOS, uh, iPad, different form factors for Android. And you can create form designs that are specific to different platforms, and then those get linked into your executable. And when you run your application on a different platform, uh, it looks at the resolution Android one, two, three times, uh, Retina versus non-Retina on OS X and iOS, and your application will snap to it. You can also use uh, anchors and alignments, so the, the ability to specify uh, a, uh, let's put a, a button down, for example. Uh, so you can anchor you can anchor a button, uh, its property, like its top left, for example. You can use alignments as well. And then you can align your components to different parts of uh, the user interface. And there's containers. So if we go over here and we put a toolbar, for example, and by default, it'll align to the top. But maybe you want your, uh, you want your toolbar at the bottom then you can just take the button and put it in the toolbar. And then you could say, for example, uh, align that button to the left or fit left or whatever, and now it's aligned there. So that button will always be uh, on the toolbar for your platform, whether it's Windows, iOS, Android, OS 10, for example. You can also anchor its, uh, its left and bottom, for example, or just its left top. So no matter what happens, that'll always be in the left top of a container or on the form. So the combination of alignments and anchors uh, is one way. And then we have uh, other components or containers that allow you to do uh, relative alignment within side of a container. So there's uh, lots of control for dealing with, with multiple form factors in when you have the multi-device version, the multi-platform version, then you'll see all these different views under the views of the designer, including the orientation, uh, landscape portrait. Those are grayed out because it doesn't, there's nothing like that specifically on Windows, but there's a little uh, rotation icon on this uh, designer toolbar for dealing with that. So yeah, for multi-device and FireMonkey, but we have videos that show you all of that. Uh, Jim has articles in a video about how to create your own custom views for other form factors for devices. But all that is handled in, uh, in FireMonkey itself, and you can uh, control that at design time as well. And we support Subversion, Mercurial, and Git. Uh, it's under Tools Options. You can choose the the subversion uh, or the version control that you're using. There's also third-party technologies for hooking other things like PVCS and so on. So uh, there's a file new um, uh, open project from version control. So that's, I forgot to point that out, open file from version control. And then there are tools, options, 
uh, there's a choice here for, so you can set up your options for Git, Mercurial, and Subversion. Um, out of the box, by default, we support Subversion, but again, you can uh, you can choose uh, Mercurial and Git as well for integrating into source code control. And here on my blog on the Embarcado community site, community.embarcado.com, uh, just go under uh, blogs, David I sip from the fire hose, and here's the C++ Bootcamp Monday, August 8th, building your first application with C++ Builder. I have the day's agenda each day. Uh, today, building the app. Uh, tomorrow, creating f user interfaces with animation effects with FireMonkey. Uh, on Wednesday, C++11 Deep Dive. On Thursday, game development with C++ and FireMonkey. And then on day five, we're going to take a look at how to take your existing FireMonkey projects and move up to mobile and multi-device application development using the Pro Enterprise Architect higher end editions, uh, not the C++ Starter Edition. You can also use the 30-day uh, trial. That's the Architect Edition of C++ Builder. So you could download that and test out all the mobile platform development with FireMonkey, do multi-tier, database access, and so on. That's the Trial Edition. The Starter Edition is Win32, VCL and FireMonkey, as I mentioned and demonstrated. And then I have uh, information links to different uh, product pages and the command line compiler and how to get the Starter Edition. Uh, a YouTube video that I did about just quick seven-minute overview of the C++ Starter Edition. Uh, the CPP reference page with compiler support that lists the Embarcadero C++ Builder Clang Enhanced 10.1 Berlin compiler. Uh, the link to Bjorn Strustrup's a tour of C++ on the ISO CPP Foundation site, isocpp.org. Uh, just isocpp.org slash tour. Uh, Bjarne has given four chapters, beginning chapters of his tour of C++ book. You can download those PDFs and learn more about the C++ language. I'll keep updating that blog post with additional links and links to the source code projects that I showed during the demos. So you'll find all of that on my blog post uh, for today. I'll keep adding to it. And now it's time for your questions. And on the screen is the short URL for the day one blog post with additional links to information as well as link to the source code projects. I'll be updating my blog post with the link to the replay video when it's completed later today. Okay, a couple of people are saying they're still waiting for their key. Uh, so uh, check your spam folder. That's a good way. You can also go and choose to get sent a, a, a sec. Another key, it'll it'll send you your key again if you go back to the shop site and, and order. It'll, uh, it'll tell you the key that you have. Um, so apparently there was a, yeah, Jim, quite a bit of demand for these keys. And so sales is generated from the keys manually. So if you haven't received your key, you can send David Millington an email at david.millington at embarcadero.com. He's the C++ product manager we talked earlier, and he will uh, see what he can do to help expedite that. Because apparently the demand has been quite uh, quite a bit. So there's some some of the sales has fallen behind as far as getting those keys. So okay, let's see. Uh, so again, the question about example code, I will zip up all the code and uh, look for my blog post. I will add a link to a zip file download where you can get the sample code. Uh, the samples like the, the 3D planets, uh, the activity indicator, the split view and all of those, those are samples that ship with the product, with the starter edition. Okay, let's see. Uh, the free compiler, the command line compiler is Windows only. The starter edition is Win32 only. And then if you upgrade to Pro Enterprise or Architect, then you get uh, all the platforms and other capabilities, multi-tier database and so on. Uh, our ID runs on Windows. Um, so uh, what I was using is I'm, I have a MacBook Pro. I run Parallels, but you can also use... Uh, VMware, and you run the ID on a Windows machine or on a Windows VM, and then you we have a technology for in the Pro Enterprise and Architect for compiling and uh, and uh, targeting Mac OS 10, iOS, and Android. So uh, that's the way all of that works. Uh, 
under the covers. And there's more information about that in the doc wiki for uh, for C++ Builder about how to do multi-device development. We have lots of videos as well. If you go to the Embarcadero TechNet channel on YouTube, you'll see uh, lots of videos and how to very short how-to videos on a whole range of topics about how to use 10.1 Berlin. Um, So in our world, you know, there was a comment about Xcode being for uh, OS X and iOS. Uh, in C++ Builder, once you have uh, the Pro Enterprise Architect Edition, the multi-target, it's one set of source code recompiling it. FireMonkey and the underlying runtime library that we provide in the paid version versus the starter edition, those higher editions, allows you to just change the target platform. You just recompile under the covers. It compiles and builds an app bundle for OS 10, an app bundle for iOS, an APK file for Android. Uh, we also have components for the camera, you know, on the smartphones for cameras, the GPS for, for orientation sensors and all of that, support Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE, all of those things are in the Pro Enterprise and Architect Edition, plus cloud-based development, uh, talking to SQL databases, and so on. So the great thing about using this ID, it runs on Windows, is you compile your code targeting the different platforms. We build uh, those native code, optimized machine code, uh, with Clang compilers that are on the Windows machine compiling for those target ARM processors for iOS and Android and the uh, Intel processor on OS X. So one set of source code, just recompile uh, for each target platform and your same code runs on multiple places. You can still do if defs on platforms if you need to do something specific for OS X, something specific for iOS and Android. The difference in our compiler and the Clang compiler is that we have, we take the Clang open source compiler and we add extensions to the compiler. So we add extensions, for example, for Windows-based development. Uh, we add extensions for working with uh, our Delphi language and some of the runtime libraries that are using Delphi. Uh, for example, VCL and FireMonkey being implemented. Uh, but we also have the standard C++ runtime library that we get from uh, Dinkumware and, and some of the Boost libraries as, libraries as well. And so we have enhancements in particular to support certain Windows-isms uh, that are that are extensions to uh, the Clang and Clang compiler. So I use the term Clang enhanced, meaning it's the standard Clang compiler we're we're using currently version 3.3, and we add some language enhancements to it to support Windows specific based development. Otherwise, it's uh, it is the open source Clang compiler, and we as we find things, we give those back to the Clang uh, open source community as well. Uh, for unit tests, yeah, we have uh, unit testing, and I think Jim put a link in there. We have uh, unit testing for C++ that uh, that you can use to test your methods, uh, in, in passing parameters, and so on. So, yeah, we have uh, unit test, and Jim put a link into the unit testing overview. About doing that project setting, there was a question about doing that. You can create these things called option sets, and then you can apply an option set. Um, We've been, been talking with the compiler team. I think uh, in future releases, not in 10.1 Berlin, but in future releases, the default for the compiler will change so that use classic compiler will be turned off by default when you say file new project. Right now it's on because we had customers from the past who, who were using the old classic compiler and were used to that. Uh, but I think, and I'll leave that to David Millington and the future, about whether that option will be turned off by default for new projects that you create in future releases. Uh, David, it will be off in, in the future release, so the next release. Okay. Uh, Godzilla, as currently codenamed, will we'll use the new Clang compiler by default. Okay, great. It's sort of, you know, when some changes might be big, sometimes we, we sort of move people into it. But option sets are a way to uh, to deal with that right now. And Jim's got that uh, information in the Q&A log. There's a question along the way about uh, what about the programmer's editor. There are choices for the key bindings uh, for the editor under tools options. Uh, there's uh, there's some environment options for, 
for doing uh, choosing the key bindings. You can also choose how your code gets formatted as it's being generated and as you're typing, because uh, people have different choices for how they want their C++ code to look, what the indentation levels, and so on. So all of that is set under the tools options. Um, and in those options, there's a code editor section and code formatting options that you can choose. Um, Let's see, for standard library, again, we, uh, for the C++ standard library, we license the Dinkumware standard library for Windows, and then we use the standard library, C++ library that comes with the different platforms like OS X, iOS, and Android. Those are provided as part of, like the Android NDK or native SDK, for example. Uh, so we, uh, we use those under the covers. Uh, but we have the Dinkumware library, standard C++ libraries uh, for Win32 and Win64. Okay, and again, we're supporting C++11, so that's why I put the, uh, the link in my blog post to CPP reference, uh, and you can just scan down, or you can go in the doc wiki uh, and look at the C++ language support. We have a similar discussion of what's in the latest version, 10.1 Berlin, as it relates to the C++ language. So everything that I showed, uh, there was a question here about uh, what about Windows 7. Uh, I was running on Windows 7 uh, in my demos with the starter edition, but I also have a Windows 10 VM. Everything I showed that was VCL, the animate indicator, the split view, and so on, the, the VCL styling, uh, and all the FireMonkey work, all of those things run on Windows 7 and Windows 10 and Windows 8.x as well. Uh, and... Uh, so the best thing is to go to the product page, and there's a uh, not only the feature matrix, but there's the the uh, the product data sheet, and it talks about what the IDE needs to run, uh, and then what versions of Windows we have certified our uh, our runtime libraries for both VCL and FireMonkey. So. Uh, we test everything on Windows 7, 8.x, and 10, and those are the target platforms for Windows that we that we for sure support. Uh, some customers have been able to run some of the VCL and Windows applications on, on older versions of Windows, uh, but I think our latest certification is for probably Vista and above. I don't like to think about Vista anymore. I'd rather just say Windows 7 and later. That's, uh, that's a good uh, for sure thing. Okay, so the, the book that I was mentioning is if you go to isocpp.org, that's the um, C++ Foundation organization that uh, Embarcadero is a member of and many other compiler vendors are members of and, and community members as well. Uh, Bjarne Stustrup has a book called A Tour of C++. It's a great, gentle introduction to all the things that are cool uh, in the modern or latest version of C++11 and, and such. Uh, there are four chapters. The first four chapters of that book are available as PDF files on isocpp.org. So it's, it's uh, Bjarne Stustrup's A Tour of C++ book. It's available in print form. It's also available in, uh, in PDF files, the first four chapters. And then there are many chapters after that as well in his ebook and, and printed book version. He also, Bjarne, of course, is the author of, of some of the most definitive design and, and, uh, and language books for C++. So um, I have a link on my blog post to the ISOCPP page that has the links on it to the four chapters that you can download for free. And so I'm, I'm slowly working on building samples that work with C++ Builder, Starter Edition, Command Line Compiler, and above uh, that do the same examples that he does uh, in his uh, tour of C++ book. There was a question here about in VCL and FireMonkey themes, can they be changed? That means they are not native. So uh, if you don't do anything in VCL, and if you don't do anything in FireMonkey to change the style, then the default style is the Windows style, whatever that Windows style is. There is a choice for using uh, the operating system, Windows operating system style by default, even if you don't add other, other styles. That's in a project option. But if you want to 
use other styles and we provide some custom styles that are pretty cool like a Tron type style for example um, then we have the VCL styles and the fire monkey style books and I think Jim I think you maybe maybe you'll cover styles tomorrow on day two um, especially for for fire monkey uh, by default we choose the native style um, for each platform when you target that platform. So you saw in Windows, uh, for VCL, for example, I had the default style just be Windows style, and that's the old Windows style. But for example, if you want to have the new, newer looking Windows 10 style, then we have several Windows 10 styles, optional styles, including the default Windows 10 style. It's subtly different. Uh, and so, again, if you don't have a style and you run on a platform, then we check to see what the default style is and give it to you. Otherwise, you can choose specific styles. You can also write your own code to, in, to interrogate what platform you're running on and what version of Windows you're running on and see what that version is. And then you could choose in code to set your application style as well. So it's, it's all possible both at design time and at runtime to deal with styles. Okay. Right now I'm on the product editions page, so if, if that's near the end, I've just left the product editions page on the screen uh, while we're doing the Q&A. Uh, okay. Again, more about the C++ language and what it's all about is, uh, is on Wednesday. This day was the first just introduction to here's our ID, here's our compiler, here's how you can build some applications, here's a little bit about C++. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow is about user interfaces and building responsive applications. Wednesday is a deeper dive and in, in discussion about more about the C++ language. Oh, somebody wanted to know about doing cloud-based things like Google Drive, Facebook, and so on. Um, the TMS software has their cloud pack, software cloud pack um, does all this for Delphi and C++. So just search TMS, T, the letters TM, Mary S, Sam, um, software cloud pack, and you'll see uh, they've got Facebook, Docker, they've got a whole bunch of components that you can use in your C++ applications for uh, hooking to different cloud-based systems, Dropbox, a whole bunch of them, Twitter, and so on. So check that out, TMS software cloud pack. If you lose any components, if you choose FMX or VCL, uh, not really. Uh, VCL is, again, tied to Windows API specifically, whereas FireMonkey generalizes but also provides support under the covers for Windows, OS X, iOS, and Android. So the way I like to tell people is how you're going to start. If you're only going to build Windows applications ever, you can decide to use VCL. It's more optimized specifically for Windows. But if you want to build multi-device at some point in time, even if you're going to start with Windows, then use FMX. That's just the way to start. FMX is for multi-device, multi-platform GUI development, 2D and 3D. VCL is 2D uh, on Windows, and it's Windows only. So that's the difference. Otherwise, uh, you know, the components are the same. In fact, there are many components that are common across Windows and the other platforms. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bluetooth is common across the different platforms, for example. Uh, other kinds of non-visual controls. Um, if it's non-visual, in general, it means it works with both VCL and FireMonkey framework. So if you want to do multi-device, but if you have Starter Edition for free, uh, you're doing Win32, that's good. It's a good way to start. And then as you upgrade to add other platforms, you just recompile, and the same application runs on all the other platforms. Some people had older versions of CBuilder, and they wanted to know about uh, the new version. And I think, David, you were answering some of the the reasons why I moved to the feature, latest, you know, newer version of Clang, version 3.3, so more language support, uh, newer components for Windows 10 in the VCL and for FMX, or some of the things, of course, the bug fixes that have happened, quality enhancements, new documentation, new samples, all sorts of things since XE5, you know, your five, six releases behind. 
So there's all sorts of good things that way. People had asked about uh, the IDE. The IDE runs on Windows. It's still a Windows-based IDE. It's not a OS 10 or Linux-based IDE. Uh, again, the IDE running on Windows can target Win32, Win64, OS 10, uh, iOS, and Android development. In the starter edition, it only comes with VCL and FireMonkey for Win32. But if you upgrade and you'll see all the cool things you can do throughout the week uh, to the Pro Enterprise Architect Edition, then you get all the targeting of the multi-device target platforms, especially in the uh, Enterprise Edition. You can also talk to remote data, SQL databases and, and cloud and multi-tier uh, architectures. And, and it's on Friday that we'll give you a... Uh, a lesson of how you can take your FireMonkey Win32 apps that you build in the starter, and then by upgrading to to Pro Enterprise and so on, how you can just take the same source code. You'll see designers appear in the IDE, and you'll be able to target set target platforms for OS 10, iOS, and Android. Same source code, just recompile, and your apps will lay out nicely on one, two, and three, three and a half, is it times resolution? Um, different form factors, different orientations, so smartphones versus tablets. All of that is built into the designers and into the IDE and into FireMonkey. And I think, Jim, you're doing uh, effects and animations and other FireMonkey stuff on Tuesday, and then there's more FireMonkey on game development Thursday, and then you'll see even more how you can take all of that and, and compile it. Again, native code, optimized machine code for Intel processors and ARM processors on those platforms, right? What else? Again, the starter edition key is a is a you know it's a it's a you know it's a perpetual license. So you get it, you can keep using it. Uh, the license agreement just says it's meant for uh, you know independent developers to build a few projects, build projects for nonprofits, build projects for yourself. There's no charge. If you start generating revenue, then we, we'd like, the license says after you've made, what is it, $1,500 or something, you should take that money and upgrade your license from starter to pro and above. But if you're doing nonprofit or free work, you can use the, uh, the starter edition for, for a long time. The trial, which has everything in it, multi-device, mobile compilers, everything is a 30-day trial license. So if you want to do something to try out all the mobile stuff right now, the 30-day the trial will be great for you to download versus uh, purchasing for $0 uh, special promo price, uh, the starter edition, which is Win32 only. And then David and or Jim, if someone has the starter edition and they upgrade, I, I thought you could just put the new license, the pro or enterprise license in, and then use the feature installer under tools, manage platforms, and you'd have more choices there for platforms. But maybe you need to uninstall, reinstall, Jim or David? I think Pro comes with a number of other elements, like the full source code for the RTL and VCL and FMX and that kind of thing. So if you happen to do a full uninstall and reinstall, then you will get all, all those extra, okay. extra pieces. Got it. Okay. Yeah, the trial and the starter edition does not have the source code to the runtime library uh, or the, the VCL and FMX frameworks. Um, but it gives you all the components and all the, the capabilities that you need. Again, uh, once you, oh, we support Retina Display. So once you get to Red Studio or C++ Builder uh, with mobile add-on, uh, then we support Retina Displays on iOS. We support the multi-resolution Android. Um, we support, the ID has a setting for 4K high DPI, and you can also build Windows apps uh, that look great on high DPI monitors. So all of that is included in the 10.1 release. We I think we added 4K and high DPI support in 10.0 Seattle, and then updated it and added more capability. We support multi-display, multi-monitor display, both in the IDE as well as in applications you build. So there's a, a uh, displays array that you can that FireMonkey or VCL gives you. Uh, we support, of course, since I think uh, Windows 7 multi-touch, 
on both Windows and on uh, on tablets and phones. So I've done videos in the past that you can put all your fingers down on the tablet or down on the phone and get the multi-touch uh, capability. And there's an on tap and on touch, and it gives you an array of the touch points that you can do, plus all the interactive gestures of pinch and zoom and rotate and so on. All of that I, I, you'll see happening over the next few days and in videos that we have as well. Jim, I, I know Marco blogged recently, Microsoft just released their Windows 10 Anniversary Edition, which is supposed to include, the, the name used to be Project Centennial, now it's the, is it the Desktop Migration or Desktop App Migration Utility? They have a new name for that Project Centennial, which allows you to take a, a Windows app and create a store app. Is that right? They get lost in their latest names sometimes. But maybe Jim can chime in. Marco Cantu did a blog post uh, last week on the community site. You can find it there on Marco Cantu's blog. I know he's on vacation this week about uh, about the new release and, and things we're working on. We also have an updated roadmap article that Marco wrote that's on the community site that talks about uh, an update of the, where we're going in the coming months and, and year as well. Uh, let's see. Games are on Thursday. So I think there's four different games that Eli M built originally for Delphi using Fire Monkey. There's a Space, Inv Space Invaders game. I forget, uh, Centipede maybe, or Pac-Man kind of thing. Uh, and he's created the C++ version. So you'll see those, and you'll be able to get the source code to those C++ games. They have full audio. They run on Windows. They run on mobile. Uh, so you'll get all of that. And my blog post has a link to the parallel programming samples for the parallel four, the tasks, and the feature variables. I've added that link. And later this afternoon, I'll add the replay link uh, as well. So you'll find those. What other questions, guys, as I'm scrolling through? Yeah, 4K support. There is an ID plugin API, and I think David M. put in the link to the Doc Wiki article about uh, the extending the ID using a tools API. There's also an ebook. I'll find the link. There's an ebook on the tools API as well. I think that's linked off of the community.marketer.com under the resources menu. Uh, there's a books uh, link off the resources pull down menu. And uh, there should be a link to the ebook for Tools API uh, ebook that was done, I think it was David in the UK. Another David. Linux is on our roadmap for Linux targeting of server side apps. Again, the ID runs on Windows. In my case, I have a MacBook Pro. I'm running uh, OS 10 uh, El Capitan. El Capitan? No. Yeah. And and I, I use Parallels for my virtual machine, and I run Windows 7 and Windows 10 on different VMs uh, to run the ID, and then I can target uh, through the, the tool chain to create apps for, create APKs on Android. Uh, app bundles on OS 10 and iOS, and Windows executables on on Windows. And FMX will get you Win32 in the starter edition, and in our other editions, it'll get you Win64, OS 10, iOS, and Android. Same source code, just change the target platform. Uh, again, the starter edition is hooked, is linked, is targeted at at the no price right now, zero price. Um, with Win32, so you can get started, right? Okay. Uh, Berlin supports Postgres. Uh, there's a, uh, if you use FireDAC, FireDAC is our set of uh, database access components that aren't part of the starter edition, but they are in the pro for local database access and in the enterprise and above for targeting remote databases. We also support SQLite and our own Interbase Lite, which is a free, downloadable, embeddable uh, SQL data, full SQL database. And then we support DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, a whole bunch of databases, and that's the FireDAC. And again, the Pro Edition has FireDAC to talk to local databases. If you want to talk to remote databases, you need the Enterprise Edition. Uh, 
CSS or local SQL databases. Enterprise for remote SQL database. Okay. Typing. Uh, so some of you are asking when, when we start previewing the Linux support, uh, how do you get invited to that? And contact David Millington. So david.millington, M-I-L-L-I-N-G-T-O-N at Embarcado.com. You'll see his blog post about the C++ boot camp. So you can get his name. He's just first, we're all first name dot last name at Embarcadero.com. So that's the easiest way is to talk to Dave, send David an email. And as we start previewing the Linux compilers, um, then uh, uh, you can be invited to that. Okay. And again, the replay video, I will put a link in my blog post. There's that short URL was is on the screen. Um, I'll put a link to the replay video on YouTube. Uh, our Embarcadero channel is called Embarcadero TechNet, T-E-C-H-N-E-T. -E That's the name of the channel on YouTube. And then we have playlists. So there'll be a, a C++ bootcamp playlist. And I'll put the playlist and the specific replay for day one links on my blog post as well. Okay. Uh, in the there's a question here about tutorials and how to use the IDE. Um, there's several things on my blog post. I have a quick seven minute video that kind of introduces you to the starter edition uh, subset of what I did today. You know that I did back in like April, I think it was. Um, but in the in the doc wiki, and I'll find that link here. Let me find that again. There is a, uh, on the uh, C++ developer's guide, there's a tour of the IDE. And let me put that link in uh, for the question there. So let's see, tour of the IDE, there it is. All right, so let me, yeah, the basics of the IDE. I showed a few things, but I put the link in, uh, I'll put it in the chat window as well uh, for the tour of the IDE doc, uh, doc wiki it goes through the welcome page and and the designers and and everything so all of that is in the developers guide let me put the developers guide in the chat window on the doc wiki that's I just posted that there's a whole C++ builder developers guide uh, it's like five part uh, doc wiki areas with that explains the IDE building apps understanding the component libraries and so on Okay, uh, and the, and somebody asked about databases in Starter Edition. Uh, no, the, the database access is in the pro and above, and you can see all that information in the feature matrix, as well as in the additions page that I link off of my blog post for day one. Uh, you'll see what different features are in the different editions. You might check those out. Um, we have support, support for Box 2D in 10.1 Berlin. But the games come on Thursday. The games are, are not using a physics engine. They're using FireMonkey and GPU uh, processing. So FMX, as you saw in the Planet 3D example, uh, you can do a lot with, with animations and moving objects around. Uh, we don't have a sprite engine per se, but we do have Box 2D support uh, in 10.1 Berlin. So you can check that out in the doc wiki. Just search Box 2D. And there's some 3D engines out there as well, uh, but we haven't done any specific integrations that way. Okay, there was a question here about if you use controls from the tool palette, how do you know which of them are VCL or FireMonkey? What you'll see in the tool palette depends on which project you have active in the project manager window. So for example, let's say you have a project group, one with a VCL, project and, and one with an FMX project, whichever of those projects is activated, the tool palette will show you all the components that work with that framework. So if you say file new FireMonkey uh, application or multi-device application, multi-device meaning fire equals FireMonkey for, for UI, but you could have a multi-device console application, a multi-device, uh, you know, 
server-side application or whatever. So if your project is a FireMonkey project, then you'll see components that are FireMonkey in the tool palette. If it's a VCL project, you'll see components that are only VCL components. Non-visual controls like database access and uh, cloud and other things, those are non-visual and, and are not tied specifically to a, to a UI or GUI framework. So non-visual controls, uh, for example, uh, uh, database access, uh, those can be used in either types of applications, VCL, console applications, server application, or FireMonkey. Uh, oh, somebody says, my parallel programming library link is broken. I'll fix it. Okay, Doug, sorry about that. Shoot, that's not good. Let me click on it. I pasted it. No, it works. The parallel, oh, let's see. Yeah, I clicked on the link. Uh, if you see the, if you go back to my blog post at the bottom, the C++ demo source code, C++ parallel programming library project code, I just clicked on that link. Uh, you might try it again, Doug. It, uh, it, I just clicked on it and it worked for me. So again, I'll, I'll put that link in the Q&A log. Not that one, that's the wrong one, David. Uh, sorry about that. Let's copy that link address. There we go. That code central link uh, 30589 does work. Okay. All right. Scrolling down. Yeah, I just clicked on that and it worked. So huh. I'll try it again. Maybe code central had a, a momentary burp. Uh, yeah, it's getting to it. So just try it again, Doug. Uh, and uh, the, let's see, bad link show server slash, again, try, uh, well, you just, you just said you tried again at 12.04. Uh, hmm. Jim or David M., can you try the Code Central link for my PPL projects code and see what you're seeing on your end? Because I'm, I'm here inside the firewall in the studio and I click on the link and it uh, it definitely pops up the Code Central page. And from there, you click the download button and the download button uh, goes. So I just tried it here, David, and it works for me. Okay. And he's, David M's where, well, you're in Estonia, so it works there. Okay. Ole, the the world. Yeah. Ole, Ole, Ole said it works for him as well. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, okay, there's some other sort of off-topic type questions that we'll save the Q and A log, and and we'll get back to some of you, you know, to those of you that have some of those questions that aren't specific to the boot camp. Uh, we'll send you emails uh, to get there. Uh, we don't create Windows Store apps yet, so uh, that's a that's something that. 10.1 Berlin. Uh, again, on our roadmap, you'll see uh, the discussion of a few plans for a future release that supports uh, Project Centennial is what it was called. And now it's like the desktop app migration or whatever they, they call it at Microsoft these days. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jim, uh, somebody's asking about Android Wear. I know we don't do Apple Watch yet. We're taking a look at that. But I've built uh, an Android application for, what is the, the Sony SmartWatch 3. Now, Jim, you were doing what, uh, Moto 360? What was the, because you did a, a form designer as well for, for Android Wear. Yeah, Berlin actually has built-in form designers for the different a few different Android devices, Android Wear devices. It has both the round, like the 360, and the uh, square, like some other devices. And I've tested it on probably four different Android Wear devices, and all of them it just works like a champ. It just uh, as soon as you have your USB drivers installed, it shows up like any other Android device, and you're able to target it directly and build apps for it. So it works great. Okay. 
Yeah, uh, somebody's asking about .NET support. We don't do .NET support, although you can, I mean, you can use some .NET assemblies as DLLs on Windows. Um, but there's no, we don't do any specific wrapping or native wrappers over .NET. Um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, you might check. Uh, go, talk to A to Z about IntraWeb. Uh, we didn't. We don't include that in the starter edition because uh, the starter edition is meant for building desktop apps and console apps. Um, but you might talk to the A to Z folks who make IntraWeb. Uh, so IoT development, we have Bluetooth and Bluetooth LE components uh, in C++ Builder and Delphi. And we have, if you have the Pro and above, and you go in the Get It Package Manager, we have pre-built components for over 50 IoT devices, including uh, lights and pressure, uh, temperature sensors and blood pressure and and uh, heart rate monitors and... and uh, Z-Wave lights, Z-Wave switches, power switches. We have videos on that. So if you have Pro and above and you go to the Get It Package Manager, you'll see uh, a whole set of IoT components that you can download and install, like over 50 of them. We do have lower level T-Bluetooth and T-Bluetooth LE components so that you can do your uh, Bluetooth work at the lower level using those components to your own device discovery and, and, uh, and interfacing as well. Um, let's see, the ID and HTML, PHP, we, you can say file new, bring up and create an HTML and edit an HTML or an XML document that's on the file other, and then there's another file template for, for creating, uh, ranges of files. But we, we have a product that's part of Rad Studio, which is an HTML5 uh, PHP uh, IDE and application development system. That's part of Rad Studio, uh, Pro Enterprise and Architects. You might check that out if you're interested in HTML5, CSS3, and PHP. Okay. Um, yeah, we talked about this at 6 a.m. Somebody asked how to migrate VCL projects, uh, or at least the forms for those projects, to FireMonkey, and there's a product called Mida Converter, M-I-D-A, converter.com. If you go there, Mida Converter, M-I-D-A Converter.com, it'll migrate your forms, and then you'll still need to to migrate your code if it's some if it's C++ code, it should be fine. But Mida Converter will take your forms and it will create FMX versions of the form, so it'll convert a T button caption property to a T button text property in FMX. Uh, it'll also create database bindings if you have database support using the live bindings uh, mechanism that's included uh, in uh, for FireMonkey and VCL since the last several versions. Uh, let's see. So yeah, two D. I the games are all two D games, I believe. If I remember, I looked at them a, a month ago or so. But come on Thursday. Uh, and uh, Eli M uh, will show you and talk to you about how he did game development with audio and with animation and all of that. And they're all built in FireMonkey, so, and they'll run on Win32, Win64, OS X, iOS, and Android, if you have the right edition of the product. So the Win32 version of the games will run just fine in the starter edition. Okay. Okay, so somebody's asking about the Nordic. I have the Nordic, uh, I use uh, Nordic uh, beacons and, uh, and Bluetooth LE, so I'm not sure exactly if the NRF52 uh, from Nordic Semiconductor, I, I have a beacon from Nordic, Semi Nord Nordic Semiconductor that I can use. We have our beacon and beacon fence uh, support with T-Beacon Manager. 
so all of that is in the pro and above versions. Uh, again, the low level T Bluetooth, which is Bluetooth Classic, and then T Bluetooth LE, which is the low energy uh, Bluetooth. Uh, we have component non-visual components for those that work on Windows 8 and above, OS 10, iOS, and Android. Um, which one is it, Jim? T Bluetooth Classic. You can't use on iOS without licensing a library from Apple directly. They, they I don't care if it's a license or a library, but you have to get a special permission from Apple to do that. And um, it's something we could do, but then you couldn't do it unless you got it as well. So you have to contact Apple to get that permission in order to do that. Yeah, it's, for Bluetooth Classic. Permission requires a, a special dispensation. And then for Bluetooth LE, you need Windows 8 and higher, not Windows 7. But he was saying, no, I just tried the, I tried the short URL and it worked fine for me. So Sebastian, you might try again. Um, maybe it was a bitly screw up of some kind temporarily, but the, it, it is case sensitive too. the short URL is. Yeah, I pasted the one he had in yeah. his question and I just pasted it into Chrome and it worked just fine. So. Not sure what's happening there. That was France. Maybe something's happening over the over the Atlantic Ocean. Let's see. I'm unable to build and run the parallel demo in 10.1 Berlin. Uh, there's no special settings. The project file that I built has the use um, has use classic compiler turned off or false. You might check that again, but. The other, uh, I don't, I didn't include binaries. It's just the source code, so you can try a clean and a build. I built them with 10.1 Berlin, but I'll, uh, I'll go and triple check uh, later today. And yes, the uh, Q and A. This is the last Q and A for today and the last webinar of day one. Tomorrow again is Fire Monkey animations, effects, responsive UIs. Uh, so look at the schedule Wednesday is C++ language, Thursday is game development, and Friday is a look if you want to move beyond Starter Edition to build uh, taking your FireMonkey apps that you build and uh, and running them, compiling and running them on mobile. Again, all native code, Intel and ARM machine code. Okay, and somebody's saying the links work from Greece. Okay. Hmm. Okie dokie. Um, anything else, guys, to add? We're uh, let's see. We're we still have a little bit of time for QA, and then Link is working from Germany and from India as well. Okay, all right. Maybe something on the internet. I think that's most of the questions. There's again a few uh, questions we have to follow up. We're glad everybody could join us. Um, if there is, hopefully see everybody back for the rest of the week. If there are things that you still have questions about, you can certainly feel free to reach out to us and let us know what sort of thing you'd like to see in the future as far as uh, uh, C++ webinars go and we can see what we can do to, to, to address those issues there as well for you. So okay, keep the education going. Okay, any last words, David M? Well, thanks everyone for attending. I've been very busy responding to, uh, responding to uh, lots of questions uh, as, as David ran the, ran the webinar. It was a great session, so thank you all. Okay, everyone, uh, just bookmark my blog post, that short URL, the CPP Bootcamp 1 that's on the screen there, and I'll get the replay up on YouTube today in case you missed anything. Um, that way you'll be ready for the next four days, although, you know, it doesn't rely specifically other than orienting you to what you're seeing in the starter edition, the ID, and how to build projects and so on. Um, but more to come each day at 6 a.m. and 11 a.m. Pacific time. Okay, everyone, take care, and we'll see you again tomorrow.